go. One more thing. Why isn't this working? There. All right. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for Friday, October 11th, 2013. Now, as you can see, I am on the road in unfamiliar location and uh, trying to uh, sort of pull together technology in a rough circumstance, so I cannot guarantee that I won't just fall away at some point. So uh, I hope that's all right with you all. Now, uh, so joining me this week, we've got a very cool crew and some very interesting stories. So I should, oh, I should give you the stories. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the Juno flyby, the government shutdown, of course, uh, an update on ISIN, the triple transit this week, um, the missile launch scene from the International Space Station, uh, the death of Scott Carpenter, the upcoming Iranian sky uh, Space Cat, New Images of Nyad, and the 45th anniversary of Apollo 7, and uh, yeah. All right, and we've got a special guest this week, which is uh, Lee Billings. So I'm going to first introduce Lee Billings. Hey, Lee. Hey, so Chris, how's it going? And Lee is a uh, journalist and author and has recently written a new book called Five Billion Years of Solitude, which we, uh, we've we reviewed on Universe Today, and, oh, and Nancy's got it. So we're going to ask you a bunch of questions, but... And I also know you can't stick around for too long, so we'll be chatting with you first. But first, I need to introduce the rest of the of the panel here. So, uh, so <laughs> joining us is an iconic representation of Amy Shira Title. Hello, my webcam's not working. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's a very appropriate picture here, which is uh, you and uh, Scott Carpenter, which I think indeed is, it is. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, we have Casey Dreyer from the Planetary Society. Hey, Casey. Hey, everyone. Happy to be here. Uh, we've got David Dickinson in high definition. Hey, now in HD. Now in HD. That looks great. Um, Jason Major. Hi there. I'm in uh, regular definition. <laughs> you're, you're going back and forth. You're oscillating. I shut off my high def because it was it was killing my bandwidth. Yeah. Yeah. You were a little little janky there. Uh, and we got Nancy Atkinson from University today. Hey, Nancy. Hi, everybody. All right. So uh, before we get to all that, those other stories that we want to talk about, uh, let's talk to Lee. So uh, and now I apologize. I think I'm the only person who hasn't read your new book. So, uh, <laughs> but I know that Nancy, uh, Nancy, and definitely Amy have, and Amy's actually working on a review as well. So I'm going to let them uh, hit you with questions. But just in general, for anyone who hasn't read your your book, what is the uh, what's the book about? So in essence, it's about uh, <clears throat> this, uh, what I like to call the exoplanet boom that's going on right now in astronomy um, over the past two decades, or I'm sorry, one decade, no, two, de two decades now. I, I keep thinking that the 90s are only 10 years ago. Um, you know, about you know, the past two decades, we've been finding all these planets around other stars, and um, it's trying to kind of take a, take a glimpse or take a peek inside this unfolding revolution where we're finding um, ever smaller, ever more potentially life-friendly planets around other stars, and, and it's trying to kind of um, illuminate some of the, you know, the science, but also the scientists behind the search. So it's not just about um, the fact that we found a bunch of planets and that some of them could be habitable. It's also about, um, I guess, some of the kind of hopes and dreams and fears that have driven some of these um, top flight scientists to go out and, and try to find them and, um, and what they hope to do in the future. And uh, and so where do you think we are sort of in the sort of larger scale like like we reported in a in a hangout like this actually just about a about a year and a half ago maybe two years about the discovery of Earth-sized worlds exoplanets in some of the the Kepler data and things like that and and we've also reported on Earth-sized worlds in the habitable zone but we haven't made that Goldilocks discovery yet right Earth-sized worlds in the habitable zone that could have have liquid water where do you think we are along that that timeline? Well, you know, obviously, um, we're coming up on the thousandth confirmed exoplanet here pretty soon. It may have already happened, I guess, depending on how you count uh, the planets and what's confirmed and what counts as an exoplanet versus, you know, like a little brown dwarf or something. Uh, and that's amazing. You know, we've just seen this huge explosion, and it's just it kind of keeps going. It's There's no uh, end in sight, it seems like. Uh, you know, I think pretty soon we'll have tens of thousands or 10,000 exoplanets to talk about. And when I say pretty soon, that's on the order of, you know, let's say another decade. Um, and that's remarkable, but what's interesting is that, you know, we, we are finding, as you said, um, these potentially Goldilocks worlds more and more, and we haven't necessarily found one that's just the size of Earth in a perfectly Earth-like orbit around a perfectly Sun-like star. We haven't found a one-to-one -one exact match, but we found a lot that seemed pretty dang close. And given how much we know about um, 
life's flexibility and resilience here on our own world, we, you know, it stands to reason that perhaps once it can get started on these other worlds, on these other planets, uh, you know, in theory, they could, you know, they could be perfectly habitable too. Um, but what's interesting, though, and, and what the book tries to highlight is that there's this real difference and a disconnect between the large numbers of planets that we're finding, even potentially habitable planets, and uh, our ability to really investigate them and really follow up on these discoveries and characterize these planets and, and study them in a sense um, to find you know, whether or not they are actually habitable, whether or not they are potentially inhabited. So um, in one sense, it's really great and it's better than it's ever been and it's going to keep getting better and better. In another sense, we're kind of reaching this impasse where we're really going to start struggling to clarify what we actually know about all these planets that are pouring out of the sky. And so what do you feel about the about the upcoming missions, the follow-on missions to get that additional information? Like one of the missions that I've been most sad about is the death of the terrestrial planet finder, right? This is this amazing mission that would have followed on some of the Kepler data but actually had the ability to detect the atmospheres around some of these extrasolar planets. And of course, if you get a chance to look at the atmosphere, then maybe you've got a chance to figure out whether or not there's there's some kind of biology or pollution or something that's actually generating, you know, stuff into the atmosphere. So, so I think you're exactly right. What, what do you think is the way the the scientific instruments are being developed that will be able to fall, make these follow-on observations? I, I mean, I, I'm gonna. I have kind of the unpopular opinion that it actually is TPF. That we need to do TPF uh, via coronagraph or interferometer, or you know, let, let's at least try to get an occulter up there for James Webb. This beautiful space telescope that's costing billions and billions of dollars, and you're telling me it can't even, you know, be a poor man's TPFC. That's a TPF coronagraph. And if you have like one of these occulters, these star shades that you fly, you know, on the order of 50,000 or 150,000 kilometers in front of the uh, James Webb Space Telescope, it could do a lot of the things that, that the TPFs were supposed to do. I think that's what we need to do. Um, of course, that's not what's presently planned to happen, and, and not that what's presently planned to happen is bad. You know, you have TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, launching in hopefully 2017 from NASA. You have James Webb, which can do some follow-up. You have things like, uh, what is it, the ECO mission or the ECHO mission from, from ESA. You have uh, PLATO or PLATO. I don't know how to pronounce these things. I only read them instead of saying them all the time. Uh, so you have this suite of upcoming instruments, and not to mention ground-based stuff, extremely large telescopes, and it's all great. But um, a lot of a lot of the stuff that we're looking at that's that's kind of uh, in the pipeline already, so to speak, and that will be debuting later this decade or early next, um, is going to be relying very, very heavily on transits um, versus direct imaging. So that's great. You know, you can uh, get some information about these planets, get a lot of information about these transiting planets, and even potentially their upper atmospheres, and look at look at them for biosignatures. You know, maybe James Webb uh, will be able to look at um, the upper atmospheres of some promising super Earths and look for things like water vapor. But uh, I guess I'm of the viewpoint that when we don't know how common life is out there, when we don't really know how common habitable conditions are out there. We need to try to make our sample size as large as we can. Um, if you're only going to be able to investigate a very small handful, a vanishing fraction of planets around nearby stars solely because they transit, um, you know, if you don't find anything, you don't really know what that's telling you. If you're only looking at five super-Earths with James Webb and looking at their upper atmospheres, and you don't find anything, you don't know what that's telling you. Now, if you look at, let's say, a hundred or a thousand or a few hundred, then all of a sudden you have these statistics that you can do and you're going to learn a lot more. But that's going to require, as far as I can tell, that's going to require building something like a TPF or at least having some robust direct imaging technique, either on the ground or in space. I've never heard anyone suggest building a coronagraph for the for the James Webb Space Telescope. I wonder how feasible that is. I mean, I know there's this starshade or starshade mission where you would build this this flower petal shaped uh, starshade and then send it 10,000 kilometers away from the observing sat telescope and then and then make your observations. But the thought about just launching one of these star shades and then just making it available to the James so Webb when it needs to, or maybe even some of the other instruments that are out there. You can make this kind of general purpose star shade out 10,000 kilometers away from everybody, and then they can just they can use it if they need to. Yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of problems with the star shade idea. The tolerances, um, when you're looking at, at how precise the shape has to be, are, are ridiculous. You know, this is something that's going to have to autonomously unfurl in space probably, um, it, it's gonna, it has a lot of problems with slewing between targets and how long that takes. Um, it, I mean, you have to think about the, the culture, the starshade, 
as a coronagraph. It's just a, um, it's a free-flying coronagraph, uh, as someone else just said. It's, uh, it's just not inside the telescope. So it loses a lot of the agility that you have when it's just a little piece of glass or something that's actually on the mirror itself, uh, like, uh, like most of the notional TPFC designs. Um, what's great about the occulter is that because it's external, uh, it, you know, it, it gives you broadband, a broadband, really deep shadow, so it's great for getting spectra, um, and it's, uh, it, it, it can be used with, a, you know, kind of a general purpose space telescope. You, you can't do something like a, like a planet imaging or, you know, a life-finding uh, coronagraph on James Webb, as far as I understand, because of the segments in the mirror, they just essentially are going to cause too many wavefront errors to cascade down the optical train, but I, I am not an expert on that, actually, so, um, you know, I'm... Just kind of throwing things out. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I, I always look for these little nuggets of ideas and, and just chase them down the rabbit hole too. So, the, the, um, I'm, I'm kind of interested. You were talking about the, you touched on a little bit about the differences in the counting for exoplanets, like the different databases. How, how we, I know we're coming close to a thousand, but I notice when you look at like the exoplanet encyclopedia, different sources show different numbers, and I was wondering. Uh, what accounts for those differences? Why are they they usually they're close but not the same? I think a big part of it is um, uh, just the classic the classic debate over what is a planet. And uh, I can't remember the exact specific numbers, but you know the Exoplanet Encyclopedia that's run by uh, Jean Schneider, um, I think has a cutoff of somewhere on the order of I think it might be 15 Jupiter masses. And okay. so a lot of other people would say 15 Jupiter masses, man, that's, that's a brown dwarf. dwarf. That's yeah. not a planet. Um, so there's that issue. And then there's issues where, you know, does a, does a, what about this free-floating crazy object we just found 80 light years away? What is that? Is that a planet? Uh, it's not around a star. So what does that make it? Is it one of these planemos? You know, there's all kinds of nomenclatural issues. Um, but the point is, is that, you know, yeah, roughly, we're on the order of 1,000 exoplanets where before... A, you know, back in the early 1990s, we had one or two or zero. So it's it's incredible. Now, Lee, that's that's confirmed exoplanets, right? I mean, there's actually more, a lot more candidates that are sitting in the wings, waiting to have their their badges put on and say, you know, you're an exo, you're a planet, move on. You're an exoplanet, move on. So, right, right. Um, you know, to to graduate to that level. So, uh, they're you know, we're we're actually on our way to that that 10,000th, really, if you think about it. Yeah, it's it's super exciting, and uh, and you know I just think I think that that we can't we can't get too when I say we I'm talking about people who are kind of in the you know in the space science community in the astronomy community just real hardcore geeks right you can't get too excited about these huge numbers without also seeing uh, almost like a, a kind of tragic thing going on here again which is just this disconnect where we're finding all these planets. It, oodles and oodles of them, and Kepler alone has just provided us with what are going to be, you know, several thousand, it looks like, because, what is it, like 90% of the candidates are estimated to be real when you run the numbers, so, yeah, it's mind-boggling, but how the heck are we actually going to go out and investigate these planets, uh, particularly ones that are around the nearby stars? It's it's really, um, it's kind of sad. I, I hope that I'm not going to be uh, old and gray and, you know, in my 70s by, by the time we finally get around to doing this. Yeah. Yeah, and you and I talked about this Lee earlier this week, and I just posted a Q and A on you know, on Universe Today that we did, and uh, the other uh, kind of unknown is how much funding that NASA is going to get to to do some of these things. Right, right. The notion of whether NASA is even the right path to to go to go down, or whether there's other alternate paths using philanthropy, or you know, I I, I don't know if we're going to be able to crowd crowdsource and crowdfund uh, you know a five billion dollar space telescope. Um, but it sure seems like it's going to take a long time if we're going the NASA route. So it's it's a it's a scary time. And you know, one other thing is like I just want to say, that, um, you know, I'm obviously really biased, and this is something that 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 is obviously in our um, Q and A, Nancy. I'm really biased. I just wrote this whole book about exoplanets and um, an exoplanet nut. But at the same time, you know, there's a lot of other worthy, important things and deep questions in astronomy and cosmology and astrophysics that are begging to be answered. You know, we are in this golden age. Of uh, of astronomy and space science and and uh, it it's it's tough that we have to make these kinds of hard decisions. I, I I like to think that you know maybe the big ambitious just general purpose observatory model can move forward where you know you can have some kind of Battlestar Galactica style space telescope, the next generation of James Webb that will be able to kind of satisfy everybody and do everything. But gosh, it's just really hard to see how that's going to happen. 
So I think we have to make some hard choices. And, and I really like cosmology. I, I want to find out what dark energy is. I want to figure out gravitational waves. I want to figure out supermassive black holes and all that stuff. But, you know, the element that is so important to think about is that the NASA way is publicly funded science. And you have to make, I think, appeals to the public. You have to bring your case to the public. And when you're dealing with something like gravitational waves or, or refining the cosmological constant, I feel like it's a really tough sell versus, oh, my gosh, let's go find ET. So... Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can imagine that situation if such a, if, if some kind of coronagraph does happen and some like a like a terrestrial planet finder does does get developed, and it actually senses say pollution in the atmosphere of another Earth-sized world, like that's motivation to take that science to the next level. I mean, it's only the most one of the most important scientific questions we could possibly ask. Which yeah, you know, be alone in the universe. You know, that's all. So <laughs> it's it, 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 fallout it, or something like that. Yeah, that we're so close to being able to answer this question. You know, now we've got the planets. Next up, let's find out whether these planets have life on them. We're so close. Right. Let's so, do it. Let's go out there and do it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Amy, you're you're reading uh, Lee's book. Uh, yeah, I've been trying to figure out how to jump in without giving a, a visual signal here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Normally, you're just like this. So. Just start waving my hands wildly in the air. Uh, no, but just in terms of like talking about how it's really hard to fund these big missions because I. I it's so hard to have anybody who's forward-thinking enough, like a president who would okay a program that's not going to happen within his time in the White House. Um, but, like, and, of course, these these terrestrial planet finder missions and these big exoplanet missions are so long-term. Um, I mean, a couple of things I just kind of wanted to know if anybody has anything to say about is how is there a way to sort of not repurpose James Webb because I, I think it's got a pretty good purpose, but um, sort, of, sort of add something to that to give it this extra... Capacity. I mean, I just I don't know enough about the hardware on that one to sort of comment on it. But I feel like there's enough of a motivation to do that. And I was just going to add that Lee, I think you made a great the scientists that you interviewed and the stuff that you brought out of those interviews. There's a great motivation for why we should be doing this. And that I can't remember who said it, but something along the lines of that when we find if we find that there's other habitable habitable <laughs> words, it'll change the way our humanity sort of that we'll look at our own humanity, that it's sort of, you know, we go to the moon to discover the Earth, but it's it's kind of the same thing, but on a much grander scale, that, like, if we're not the only people out there, then it gives us a whole new way to look at ourselves. And I think that's actually a really compelling reason in itself. Uh, but yeah. I'm a geek, so, you know, I can't... <laughs> I don't expect everyone... Nothing wrong with like, that. I feel like that's the motivation that a lot of people would be able to get behind in terms of, like, just talking about NASA being publicly funded science. So I'm just sort of... I don't know, does anyone have any thoughts about, like, adding stuff to James Webb? I'd like to say just two things, and then I'll get out of the way, because I know I've been like, blah, 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 and just kind of monopolizing real quick. But um, I'll just say that the, the occulter idea, the starshade idea, the TPFO idea that we've been talking about in the earlier portion of this broadcast, um, folks at, at the Space Telescope Science Institute, you know, uh, Matt Mowden and, and his associates have run the numbers on this, and according to them, you know, it's going to be on the order of uh, uh, a little upwards of $500 million, half a billion dollars, maybe $700 million to go out and, and, and build this thing and kind of add it on to the web, essentially, as this free-flying addition. Um, so, I mean, the trouble is, of course, you know, web's super over budget. It's behind schedule. Lord knows what's going to happen if you try to add this piece on. But people are already doing that. You know, they're, they're doing tests at Princeton, and um, I but think... You think uh, want to get the most out of their buck for James Webb if it's gone this far over budget. Like, I mean, on NASA think, scale, half a billion dollars is not that much more if you're going to get a whole other... Like aspect of a mission out of it. Preaching to the choir here. <laughs> no. yeah, yeah. yeah, well, NASA is also uh, completely shut down, so I think we've got to yes. can really get a sense of its uh, <laughs> of sort of how much the money issues are right now. Yeah, and, and just the, the one other thing I want to say real quick about the notion of our, you know, oh, we went to the moon to discover the Earth is simply that, um, I, you know, you, t you talk to these people, the people at the forefront, I mean, and a lot of, of y'all are obviously at the forefront, and you know way more about this stuff than I do, and um, I'm sorry I haven't talked to any of you for the book, you know, there's, there's so many people working, it's amazing, it's, again, this golden age, um, but you talk to the people who are really in-depth looking at the questions of planetary habitability and how life started and, and all these questions, and um, in particular when you think about kind of ascending the chain of being and you think about not just being single-celled organisms, but you think about something more complex, multicellular life, something that could build radio telescopes or rockets and, and that kind of stuff. Um, 
you look at all the things that are required or seem to be required, at least here on this planet, for us to be here. And uh, looking at all that and thinking about the notion that we can look out to the nearest hundred stars or nearest thousand stars, I'm not really convinced that we're going to find anything to talk to. Uh, I don't even know if we're going to find signs of life out there in that bubble of space. Maybe we will, but we don't know. Um, and so I think it's equally powerful to think that we could go out and we could, you know, give it the good college try and look for these signs of life on all these other planets that we suspect exist around nearby stars, and we won't find a blooming thing. And I think that's uh, a pretty incredible answer too. If we're that rare, I think that's yeah. a pretty. It's a. Uh, it's kind of sad. Yeah, that we could have an, aliens, but. an equally profound effect on our sort of. Yeah, yeah no we're pressure. Battling we're battling not only. <laughs> it's a win-win, guys. Space, yeah. um, we're also battling the, you know, the the downside of time because not only did we have to find trying to find something that's nearby, but also nearby in the in this exact moment in time that we are. So that's the other trick, you know. Maybe it's there, but maybe we're just late or early. I guess the one thing I wanted to add is, or that I'll, that I'll kind of just, sorry, wrap up with is just, you know, um, there's been this trend, right? There's been this trend in the physical sciences for hundreds of years now saying we're not special, we're just mediocre and average and whatever, you know. We're, life is just blah, it's just so common and whatever, you know. And, and, and that may not be true at all. That may be totally false. And, and we're at this unique moment, this inflection point in our history where we're really getting to grips with it, and we're really going to start having data, empirical data, to, to give us a better idea of whether or not we're special. And I, it just boggles my mind to think that, you know, in fact, the Copernican principle, when we're, when we're applying it, I guess, to our local region, our local galactic neighborhood, you know, our nearest thousand stars, could just be wrong. We could be immensely special. And, I mean, maybe that's just hubris and, you know, me thinking I'm special. You know, I mean, everyone wants to think they're special, but it could be true. It could be true. Yeah. Yeah, no, I find I personally find the Fermi paradox uh, pretty haunting, and uh, I've I've done quite a lot of sort of speaking on that, and I find the more that I think about it, the more it seems really strange to me that we haven't found any evidence of of extraterrestrial civilizations or or anything, and uh, and so I find this direction, in my opinion, <laughs> a really high priority. The more we can get get so you know try and pull out some answers out of like what is going on with the uh, nature of life in the universe I would I would really like to put some priority on that so now um, now Lee I know you got to run and uh, and we got a bunch of other stories to get to so now you can stick around as long as you want and chime in or you can just book out right now and uh, and no one will judge you harshly um, but but it, whichever way you decide to go um, let's give that title again of the book. Oh sure, it's uh, it's it's five billion years of solitude, and uh, it's out now. Uh, highly recommended, um, and um, I, it's it's my honor and pleasure to be here. Um, I, I I you know I am I I'm kind of on a couple of different deadlines. I know there's probably maybe an editor or two of mine who's watching this, and they're like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> um, so I'm I'm actually gonna I'm gonna book out, but it's it maybe I could come back. Would you all have me back maybe sometime? Totally, your it's an open invitation. I will add you to my nag list, and you will get the uh, the notification. So anytime yeah. you want to drop by, by all means, come on come on down. And next time, I promise I won't just be like, blah, 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 my book, blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> I hope we can do it again soon, okay? All right. Well, it was great to have you. Thanks, Lovely. Thank you. And let me see. Oh, he did it all right on his own. Okay, good. I didn't have to kick him out. Uh, good. Okay, so now another person who has to leave really quickly is Casey. Oh, there's Logan right there. Hi, Logan. We see you, Logan. <laughs> uh, okay, so Casey, uh, I know you've got a book up pretty quick, so let's talk about the government shutdown. Wah, wah. And we didn't do a show last last week, and so I was, you know, that was going to be the the highlight of the show last week. But I thought, man, you know, it'll probably be over by the next show. Aren't we and so, so lucky they haven't figured it out yet? I, I know. So now we get to talk about it. Oh. You were shut Did down you, in solidarity. Did anyone see the, the, uh, the video the of the kid government. crying because he couldn't go to the NASA? Game yeah, site. Oh. oh, yeah, that was heartbreaking. Oh. Yeah, it was heartbreaking. <laughs> okay, Casey. So what's going on? Where are we at? All right. Well, we're about no closer than we were a week ago. Uh, as many of you are watching and kind of horror like I am, uh, or, uh, or kind of deeply frightened for the future of democracy in the United States, they are about you know where they were. Uh, the most people know the politics. So I'll just talk about the kind of the effects of what's happening now. And you can think of it as you, we're starting to see what what I call like the rolling consequences of the shutdown. So. Uh, you know, you had all these people who were civil servants of NASA. They were immediately kicked out of work, sent home, to the point where they can't even volunteer their time. They're legally forbidden from doing any work for the government while they're at home. And 
the intentions of that are good because they don't want to kind of push people to volunteer work for free. Um, but at the same time, it's very frustrating. So, oops, sorry. The, uh, the, uh, uh <laughs> sorry, guys. Uh, so you have all the civil servants went home right away. Uh, then at the same time, now you're starting to see subcontractor outfits like the National Radio Observatories and the National uh, Observation, uh, other observatories, the solar observatories. They're running out of the chunk of money they had sitting around, and they're starting to lay people off now, too. Uh, JPL, because it's run by Caltech, is still in operation, so you see Curiosity, uh, you see Opportunity, the other Mars probes, they're still going, Cassini's still going, but they only have as much money as the last payment that NASA gave them. That'll take them through the next couple of months. So you have this series. The longer this goes on, the more people are going to get shut down. Uh, you're also having, starting to see these kind of semi- long-term consequences of that. Uh, you're seeing the closing of the National Energy Lab, so Los Alamos, yeah. and uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which uh, some people may or may not know create plutonium-238 for NASA for its long-term space missions. They're trying they to get just, that progress. They just solved this they problem. They just restarted, yeah. They just uh, restarted plutonium production. They get, yeah, they, they just got, got it going again, and then they shut down all the mm -hmm. national labs. Uh, then you also have the, they closed down the South Pole base station. They put it into kind of a skeleton crew to take care of it. Uh, sent all the scientists home, and they're losing a bunch of uh, uh, South Pole science for the season. The SOFIA, the infrared observatory on a plane, uh, is also not flying. It's grounded. Then you also have consequences for commercial space who lease grounds from NASA. So I know that the Dream Chaser from the Sierra Nevada company, uh, that's locked up in NASA Dryden, and they can't get to it. So you're affecting all sorts of parts of this uh, process here. So it's pretty bad. So if you hate science and you hate space exploration, you love the shutdown. Not to mention yeah. all, the, all the shutdowns in other departments like the, the CDC, uh, while, you know, different types of food, foodborne illnesses have been running rampant, and, you know, all the national parks. And I mean, it's just, what a mess. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yes, a mess is a very generous term for it. The, so, uh, but I mean, I, I think, sorry, that, 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 you know, I don't know about any of you, but if, if I suddenly had to lose my job uh, and wasn't making money, I mean, I don't know how long they can go for, a couple of weeks. The average person can only go for a couple of weeks, and, and then they go and, and get a new job. So, yeah. you know, I mean, and if you're a rocket scientist working at NASA, there's not a lot of other places where you can go and get a job that's in that exact field. So you're going to have to go get a job in some related field, like in computers or uh, material science or aeronautics or things like that. And so you can imagine that within a couple of weeks, a couple of months at the maximum, all these people will have found new jobs, and there's no way to restaff these departments. So this is going to this is going to be permanent within a few months if this well, doesn't that, get solved. Yeah, and I mean, in a way you think of it, what does this tell young people who are growing up right now? Do you want to work for NASA and get kicked out of your job periodically and unpredictably and not get paid? It's sending a really bad sign to the future people who are making these decisions now, or as you said, we'll have to be find new jobs. We've been hearing reports about scientists signing up for unemployment because they're not getting paid right now. They may get money back, but who knows when that will be. Uh, it's, it's a really bad situation. So we do have one kind of bright spot, which I should emphasize. Uh, the MAVEN spacecraft, which is NASA's next mission to Mars. Yay. That'll be orbiting. Yeah, yes, yeah, so it's going to be very cool. It was set to launch November 18th, this November 18th. Um, so the shutdown, when it first happened, they stopped preparing MAVEN for launch. So it was sitting there at the Johnson Space Center, all kind of shut down, powered down. It was Kennedy Space Center, excuse me. And that was bad, because they only have so much time. They had all these things to do to prepare the rocket, prepare the spacecraft, get it ready for its launch, and they have a three-week window to get to Mars. Otherwise, they have to wait essentially 26 months. So there was a lot of trepidation about this. Then you had a senator, Bill Nelson from Florida, very nicely sent a stern letter to the uh, Office of Management and Budget saying how concerned he was that MAVEN may not make its launch window. And suddenly, you had a post hoc justification for its, uh, for its support for basically the ground communications for the Opportunity and Curiosity rover. And that 
gave them the legal maneuvering that they needed to reopen preparations. So Maven is now on track to launch November 18th. The engineers are getting it ready. They're working for free at the moment, uh, but they are getting it ready, and the rocket should be there in time for launch on November 18th. So that was a bright spot that some insanity was avoided. In that people were allowed to work, were allowed to volunteer their time to get a spacecraft. No, to they had to, to do it. <laughs> it wasn't a volunteer. That's like the weird. They're not allowed to volunteer, but they can't be forced to work for free. Oh, uh, which okay. Is what most of the government who is, yeah, so most of the government they have a special exception for military uh, personnel and active duty uh, military zones, but uh, the people. So uh, about half of the federal government is still showing up to work because they're listed as. Uh, they're they're accepted from the shutdown. They're, they are deemed essential to preserve property, to preserve safety of and and life basically. And so, but they're working. They're compelled to work, but they're not getting paid. And so, right. that's that's the kind of thing. We're not feeling the full effect of the government shutdown because we're forcing people to work for free. Yeah, and I think it's important for people to realize. I mean, for the for the rest of the government, it is. It is impacting various parts of the government, but it's not as bad. But NASA's, what, 97% of people at NASA are not working. It's like the top. It's the number one of all of the different the programs NSF, at NASA. The NSF has 99% of its uh, employees furloughed, so you have, it's the second NASA day. So the right. two scientific okay. places, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so, I mean, you know, with the other situations, you know, with the other departments of the government, it's not as critical. But with NASA, it is... It is an apocalypse to the uh, to sort of moving this all these programs forward. So yeah, the only thing NASA is really staffing is support for the International Space Station to, for the safety of the astronauts. Uh, and now you're seeing again this rolling consequences. All of NASA's subcontractors are starting to furlough their employees. So you're getting layoffs or not layoffs, furloughs in Denver at Lockheed Martin and Boeing and all these places that had contracts with NASA money. They're running out of that money. They're not getting their monthly payments, so they're starting to get the second wave of furloughs of their own contractors. So now you're starting to see these increasing and increasing effects on all of NASA's programs. And so I, we were talking about James Webb earlier. James Webb is being uh, tested, I believe, right now in a kind of a thermal, uh, forgive my uh, incorrect generalization of this, but it's under a vacuum chamber being tested right now at Goddard. And they are their test to prepare and to test the instruments that are not happening right now. They're, they're not shipping instruments to Goddard. Wow. Uh, the JWST, parts of it are moving forward, but other parts are not. And as we talked about earlier, it's hugely over budget, and the timeline is incredibly tight. Any slips in the James Webb Space Telescope's budget can literally mean tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars of added cost. So that is all this kind of big storm. And we don't even know how bad it is because NASA can't even think about how bad it is because those people who are supposed to think about how bad it is can't work or volunteer the time for NASA. How long have shutdowns happened in the past? I know there was one that happened uh, like back days. in the 90s, right? 21 yeah. days, I think, was a record in 95. Yep. Yeah. I looked so where are we at now? We're, oh, we're 10 days, right 15 yeah. hours. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's, let's talk about the fact, in addition to NASA being forced to waste tons of money by keeping these massive programs sort of on the line, that Congress is still getting paid. They're not being held yeah. hostage like the rest of They're the country. They're deemed essential. And this, this, is what, this is what really bugs me about this. I feel like if you're going to shut the government down while these bureaucrats figure out what, like, get over their little petty arguments about health care, which everyone should have, go Canada, um... They, they should also not be paid. They should also be feeling the consequences that the rest of the country is feeling. It's, so there's this website, uh, congressstillgetspaid.com, where you can actually watch how much money they're making rise as the counter accounts up how long the shutdown's been going on. It's really depressing. I believe there's also a, a website that encourages you to drunk dial Congress and just harass them a little bit. <laughs> That's awesome. So check there's another website that sends a Congress. message to Congress, but I can't repeat it on the air. <laughs> oh, that's one with a certain finger sticking up <laughs> at the end of every message. <laughs> K Casey, do you do you know if other launches out of the Cape are affected by this? Uh, are they like I know the Air Force is launching a GPS set, but I haven't been able to find information. If uh, I was thinking NASA still controls the range, and if NASA is not working. You know. Well, Cape Canaveral, they have a bunch of Air Force launch sites from Cape yeah. Canaveral, and that's actually where SpaceX and uh, even the Atlas Vs, they, they tend to launch out of the Air Force launch points. Uh, okay. NASA controls the two launch pads that used to be belong to the shuttle, and they've been trying to lease those, but nothing's launching out them at the moment. So SpaceX should be unaffected so by this. Should go and, yeah, okay. yeah, 
and and the Air Force too has actually been accepted because of the of the uh, national security uh, excuse, and so they can yeah. keep basically launching and, and going. And a lot of the sp- a lot of the defense space industry is essentially unaffected by the shutdown. So Maven was the only one on Jeopardy, but it's going now. So yes, yep, cool. that was the big one. And then you have things like Laddie and the Juno flyby, uh, because those are considered preserving the property. They allowed the engineers and the trajectory analysis and the communications to go with those so it can go into orbit around the moon. They were already in motion anyway. They had launched before yes. the shutdown, so that would have been silly. Yep. Yeah. It would have been a massive waste of money. More yes. so than <laughs> so much wasted money in this yeah. figuring out the financial yeah. mess. Yeah. It's like this isn't the best idea that's happening right now or something. It's like they haven't really thought this through very much. And Change that's kind of where we're stuck. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I look like right now. <laughs> well, I, I look forward to, I know you've got to run, Casey, and we've got to get on some of the stories. I look sure. forward to maybe next week you telling us how it all ended and, and, yeah, and how I'll things are going to get back happy. going. Yeah, yeah we'll be optimistic, be and we'll see how it's yeah. going. And if I can plug one thing before I go, sure. um, because I've been down about the, the whole politics thing, I'm, I'm going through and preparing, you know, there's a new series of Cosmos coming out next year, so, uh, Planetary Society, we're doing an online rewatch of the original series. So, I'll be writing up episode recaps, analysis, getting scientists to talk about it, and encouraging people to get together with a drink and some friends and watch Cosmos with oh, a right. Cosmopolitan or another drink. And it's so I'll be watching it every Sunday. I'll be writing up every Monday. That'll be going on for the next three months. So, I, I post a link here. You can find that on planetary.org, and maybe we can do something more fun and and well, think about okay, the all right, I'm. I'm going to reveal an idea that I've been kicking around for a couple of years now, which is doing a riff track of Cosmos. So, you know, that get a bunch of fun. astrophotographers, you know, you know, get some astrophysicists, cosmologists, whatever, and and as Cosmos is going on, do a riff track of it, and but but update the science. So yeah. not be snarky, but but like where, where Carl Sagan says, we have no idea what this is. Like, he talks about... Um, uh, quasars, and, they don't, and he, at that point, he's not really sure what a quasar is. Yeah. But there's some really interesting science that's been done. You can update that information, so I think Same that would be kind of neat. And, and the Mars stuff, and yeah, lots. So of if life. you want to, if you want, I'm all in. If you want to do that, if you want to take the hit from the uh, from the Carl Sagan uh, family's uh, sort of public relations, then uh, that sounds good. I'm in. <laughs> all right, I'll write you. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, okay, well, let's move on. So, Casey, you can run if you need to, uh, okay. but let's move on. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. Have a great uh, rest of your week, and let's not be shut down next week. All right, happy stories. We'll, we'll, we'll hope for that. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, we'll let's talk about the Juno flyby, speaking of uh, spacecraft that are still happening. Uh, yeah, yeah, Juno, um, Juno came back for a visit uh, this Wednesday afternoon. Um, as, uh, as many of you know, Juno launched uh, back in August, uh, I think it was August 5th, 2011. Um, I should know, I was there. It was a wonderful launch uh, from uh, uh, Cape Canaveral Air Force Base, and um, I was a guest of NASA, which was which was all there, everybody was working at the time. Um, so, and it's been flying ever since, and it's been doing a big loop around the solar system, going, going out past the uh, orbit of Mars, and, but instead of keeping going to Jupiter, it swung back around and visited Earth for a little uh, kick in the pants, a gravitational boost uh, from our own planet's gravity. And it came within 347 miles altitude of uh, just a little bit off the coast of South Africa um, on Wednesday afternoon. Um, oh, it got a 16,000 mile an hour speed boost uh, in doing so. And now it's heading straight out to Jupiter, um, and uh, I think there's, the meeting is going to be, well, the orbital insertion over at Jupiter is going to be on July 4th, 2016. Um, at that point, while Juno is coming uh, close to Jupiter, it'll be the fastest man-made object ever created because it's going to be going, like, over 100,000 miles an hour. <laughs> Uh, we won't cool. still be shut down by then. So, yeah, so, so is that the spacecraft? That's the spacecraft that we'll be using to describe how long it would take to get to other stars. We'll talk about Juno then. You know, I mean, Jupiter's 
gravity is just so massive that that as as Juno is approaching it, it's just going to be accelerated, accelerated, accelerated. Its velocity uh, relative to Earth is going to be simply incredible before it has to put its space brakes on and and achieve orbit. So that's going to be an exciting time uh, in and of itself because you know just because of of the engineering that's going to have to take place in order to uh, establish orbit around Jupiter. But um, you, I was. Uh... Doing astronomy cast with, with Dr. Pamela Gay, and I never I had a misunderstanding about how these gravitational assists work, and Pamela was finally able to explain it to me in a way that, that made sense. Right? Because I always wondered, you know, if you're approaching a planet, then and as you're speeding up as the gravity is pulling it towards you, and then as you move away from the planet, the gravity is then going to slow you down as you move away. And you'd, you'd figure it would be a net balance, right? That you get, you get speed increases, you get closer, but then you lose that speed again as you move far away. But where the gravitational assist comes from is the orbital speed of the planet going around the sun. Mm -hmm. And so, so what happens is that as your spacecraft moves towards, say, Jupiter, Jupiter pulls your spacecraft into the same velocity that it's using to go around the sun. Mm -hmm. Now, your spacecraft slows down Jupiter a tiny little bit to <laughs> compensate say. for this for this gravitational assist, but but the but the speed that you, but it is it does cancel out the speed that you get as you get closer to the planet, and then the speed that you get as you move away from the planet, they actually cancel it to zero. But it's that it's that orbital speed of the planet going around the. It's that the angular momentum. It's gonna it's gonna stay. Yeah. You know, it's gonna it's gonna remain because because uh, math is cool and physics is awesome. <laughs> Juno, so, yeah. Juno Juno stole a tiny bit of the Earth's momentum. Like by that's right. And so in this case, Juno is stealing a tiny little bit of the Earth's momentum going around the sun. And here's the image that I, I, I knew early. Wednesday seemed to last forever. I mean, <laughs> look at my clock. That's a, um, yeah, that's a cool picture. I hadn't seen that yet. The yeah, so this yeah, is the so image that NASA or that Juno took. It's uh, uh, we've got it on Universe today, but uh, yeah, it's pretty cool to see planet Earth. It's black and white, but I'm sure we'll get a better version it'll, of it later. It looks like something out of Space 1999. Well, yeah. that, that image that um, was taken with the Juno Cam uh, uh, methane band imaging. So it wasn't one of the visible light bands. Uh, Juno Cam has uh, red green, blue, and then the methane. Um, now, Ken Kramer did a great job uh, uh, realigning that because uh, JunoCam's push imager takes takes bands. And there, because the spacecraft is moving, there's a little bit of a discrepancy between the bands. So as a, as a, as a graphic artist, I know that it's tricky to realign those things. So he did a great job with it, it that. Lo it looks like you're seeing a little bit of Argentina right there is what I'm pretty, like, 90% certain what you're seeing. I see a yeah, and that, was, and that was, I believe, taken on a was, would that be taken on approach? I don't, I don't know the timing on that. I don't know if that was on approach well, the, or on Well, that. I know the closest approach, yeah, it went over South Africa and now out over India when it passed out of the Earth's shadow. I would, I would make an educated guess that's probably approach. Now keep in mind, Juno passed Earth at an altitude of uh, 347 miles, so that's you know not that much farther up than the um, did, than the space station. Did they ever fin figure out the uh, anomaly after it passed? That the went into safe mode. Has that ever been resolved? I think the safe mo yes, it, it was resolved. I think the okay. safe mode was due to some uh, there was a there was a battery drain. Um, uh, it, it was in the Earth's shadow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so there was a little bit of a battery drain, um, and then you know once they figured out that that was that was it, and it's it's everything's okay now. I kind of yeah. wondered that because it was solar powered, but I'm like that's a huge oversight because you think they would plan it would have enough battery power to last 20 minutes near a shadow. I think <laughs> they thought they did, but it just it uh, depleted faster than they were expecting, and yeah. or faster than the spacecraft was ready to accept, and so that's why it went my, into safe mode. My, my wow. second thought is maybe it, it maybe it jostled something inside there. They were concerned that, you know, just the, the slingshot might have, like, shuffled something around. Or, but that's cool. All right, well, let's move fun. on. We've got, we got tons of stuff still to talk about. Uh, so I would like to talk about, um, actually, uh, Angry Amy may need to switch back to Scott Carpenter Amy, and uh, we can talk about the death of Scott Carpenter this week. Yes. Um, so this is the... Let me just get this picture up. So, yeah, in, in not-so-fun news, um, Mercury astronaut Scott Carpenter died this week, died yesterday. Um, he had a stroke, I think, a couple weeks ago, and he's been in hospice care. He had been in hospice care since, and apparently um, didn't, didn't pull through. Uh, he was 88, so, you know, kind of getting up there. And it's really kind of drives home, I think, that um, a lot of these guys from this first wave of space flight and, and 
you know, the guys that started it all that I think a lot of us, no matter how old you are, kind of grew up knowing who they were and looking up to them as the real pioneers. Um, we were running out of them. Um, John Glenn is now the only surviving Mercury astronaut, which I actually think is quite fitting given how obsessive he was about his physicality, knowing that he was the oldest of the group when he was selected. Um, so I, I got to meet Scott Carpenter. I'm really pleased that that happened. And unfortunately, I have a book signed by him, but not only is my webcam not working, but I don't have a picture of it on this computer, so can't share it. But he was... He was totally lovely when I met him, despite not really being able to hear me being in a very crowded room of other space geeks. Um, but he did shake my hand and sign a book and took a bunch of pictures with me. Um, so, so unfortunately, and this is, I'm working on a blog post about this, but I just haven't, this happened yesterday, so I haven't had a chance to finish it yet. Um, Scott Carpenter kind of has the, the in, infamous flight of Aurora 7. Um, this is the flight on which he missed his retrofire time by only a few seconds, but it was enough that he actually landed 250 miles away from his intended splashdown point. Um, the, the time of the ionization blackout was longer and different than everyone had planned, and they thought he, he was dead for a while, and then they couldn't find him because he was so far away. And the, the story goes that when he when the, the Navy divers actually did find him, he was just, you know, floating in the ocean in his life raft, eating a candy bar and offered them some food and, and was very sort of, um, you know, relaxed about the whole thing, despite everyone at NASA basically having puppies. Um, now, unfortunately, the story that has been kind of gone on for 50 years, his, his flight was uh, May 24th, 1963, so we actually, I actually did see him on the 50th anniversary of his flight um, at another event, but um, the story goes is that Chris Kraft, who was the flight director at the time, blamed Scott Carpenter for not listening to him and not following mission procedures. And it's been this massive sort of, the story has always been that Scott Carpenter was the one that couldn't get it right, and that's why he never flew again, and it was this whole big thing. And it's really sort of, I think that's really quite unfair to him and now to his memory to say that it was all his fault. Because really the underlying problem is that NASA didn't know how to fly in space yet, and there was still this really big fight for control between mission control and um, and the astronauts. You know, one had all the information on the ground and the power to bring them home at a moment's notice because the Mercury spacecraft didn't exactly allow the pilot to have too much control. Whereas the astronaut was the one inside the machine and they were fighter pilots and they knew how to deal with, you know, strange situations in the air. So I think that that sort of in, in uh, you know, non-agreement of roles really came back to bite NASA in the butt a little bit on that mission. But the memory that everyone has of Scott Carpenter is messing up the flight when really it was just a, a packed science flight and he fell behind schedule and he survived and he did everything that he could and he did all met all of his mission goals except for the splashdown thing. But So that's, that's really what we should kind of remember about Scott Carpenter is that he had this massively loaded flight and there's a lot of unfair rage against him. Not rage really, but unfair blame laid upon him, but... Yeah, he couldn't be nicer. Andrew, I never heard that story. <laughs> well, that's great. Thanks, Amy. It's um, kind of the real life, real life gravity. You know, his adventures uh, up there in his in his uh, in his yeah. capsule. Yeah. Uh, so let's move on again. Uh, like I apologize, we've got about 15 minutes left, and I'm going to keep the pace uh, really frantic. Uh, so let's talk about this upcoming triple transit. This triple threat. Yes, that is going to be just in a few hours tonight. I'm going to be watching it here from North America, from Eastern North America, and from Europe. Speaking of Jupiter, we're just talking about Juno. There's going to be a triple shadow transit where you're going to see three moons casting a shadow back on Jupiter. Seeing a shadow transit isn't all that uncommon, and you see doubles there a couple times a year, but a triple is fairly rare. From 1981 to 2040, there are only 31 triple shadow transits that are actually going to happen. And Callisto always has to be involved in this. Interesting because of the uh, orbital resonance of the inner moons, and it's easier if you see the diagram I did on the post. And, and Bob King used the same uh, Wikimedia Commons diagram of the inner moons. The inner moons, Io, uh, Europa, and Ganymede are in a one, two, four resonance. And you can have two of those transiting, but you can never have one. And it makes more, or never have three. So you can only have three if you have that outer one that's not in a resonance also transiting at the same time. Again, it makes more sense if you see the diagram than me talking about it. We had a triple. I don't know if I can screen share it. I have an image I took back in 2004. There was a pretty good one. I'll try not to delete the internet by screen sharing here if it will work. 
we actually had a triple shadow transit I got when I lived in Vail, Arizona. That's a webcam stacked image that I'm. Uh, can you in, right can you make it a little bigger? I might be able to. Let's see if it will zoom. It'll also zoom all the the uh, distortion. That's fine. Too. So it look really distorted uh, through the telescope through the eight inch telescope. It, it actually uh, and that's that's heavily processed right there too. But the shadow transit tonight lasts from about. For East Coasters, it's going to last from 12.30 a.m. to 1.45 a.m., about an hour and 15 minutes. And I'm going to probably set my alarm, get up at 1, have my scope set out, and just be ready to webcam image and try to grab some images of this. Again, it's 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 kind of neat. You don't see these very often. And uh, Callisto just started the season of transits. It's the only moon that doesn't always transit because its orbit is it's far enough out and its orbit is tilted just enough that except for when you get those ring plane crossings. I'm moving my hands now. and I can't see it. But when you get those ring plane crossings, they're once every, tw twice every orbit around the sun for Jupiter, which orbits about 11 odd years or so. So we're in entering into one of those seasons right now where Callisto is transiting, so triple shadow transits are possible. And Jupiter rises locally about midnight right now. So it's going to be low to the east, uh, about 20 degrees above the horizon for east coasters. Over in the UK, they're going to get the whole thing. So that's going to be kind of cool to see. And we're clear tonight here, too, so I'm definitely going to try to image it. God, I'm wondering if we want to live stream it. <laughs> and I can't make this image any bigger, but it's uh, here's, yeah, there, the, here's there's the, the same graphic. One of the, that's the same one of the... Um, yeah. So it's yeah, it's kind of cool to see that you can actually see how how you'd end up uh, with that transit just by watching this little animated thing. Yeah, I can't stop it watching took, it. It <laughs> took me a while to figure out. Yeah, because again, they're on they're on one, two, four resonances, but they're not timed like synchronized like a clock. So they they there. transit in front from as seen from the Earth. And Jupiter's reaching quadrature tonight too, so the shadows are cast off to the side anyway. Yeah, but, uh, and of course and that's, that's not call real it time there. Shadow trans, right? You're not going to see the three moons in front of the planet, but you are going to see three shadows. Yeah, the shadows when it's at quadrature, they're being cast off to the side, kind of like the image I just showed, where the bodies of the moons themselves uh, at quadrature, they're off to the side. And this was actually when they're timing shadow transits, how they first figured out a rough estimate of the speed of light back in the 17th century, when they were watching shadow transits, they noticed that different points in the orbit of Jupiter, shadow transits were occurring a few minutes off what they predicted. And it was old Romer back in the 17th century, a Danish astronomer that correctly figured out the reason shadow transits, the timing was off is because the distance to Jupiter, the earth was changing. And he calculated the speed of light within about 90% of the actual value by using just that one observation. So that's that's pretty incredible for the 17th century that they even figured that yeah. out. All right, let's move on. Uh, not that this isn't fascinating, and I would love to see it with my own eyeballs. Um, uh, so let's, let's this crazy picture of this missile launch seen from the International Space Station. And this is yeah, yeah, it's pretty. Remind me a bit of Gravity, like the movie. Uh, okay, let me let me grab the picture here. Okay. Which, I, by the way, I've finally seen. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this came out yesterday, you know, and with the government shutdown, we know, don't know exactly what the uh, astronauts on board the International Space Station are doing right now. But um, they were all, uh, several of them, tweeted about <laughs> about this interesting picture, and uh, uh, Mike Hopkins and Luca Parpentano both um, took pictures of this kind of weird cloud that they saw in space, and. Uh, uh, I, you know, they both mentioned that they thought it was a rocket launch of some type, and uh, said, said that the this cloud that it left behind was pretty amazing. Um, I, I tried to look on various places. You know, I knew it wasn't a NASA launch because of the government shutdown, but I was looking on my various spots that I looked for launches and couldn't find anything. So I got in touch with Bob Christie at the Zaria.info website. Who usually knows, you know, launches and everything. So uh, I got in touch with him, and he said that there was a missile launch from Kazakhstan yesterday, and it was a uh, like a intercontinental ballistic missile test, and that's probably what it was. And uh, uh, it just it's just kind of unique how how it made that cloud in space. And uh, what one thing Bob mentioned is that uh, because of the timing. Of of when the the, the rocket went was launched, 
the view from the International Space Station would have been with kind of a low sun angle and the, and the sun would have been kind of shining over the shoulders of the photographers on the ISS and so that would allow for this kind of striking image against against the dark background with no glare from the sun. Did, did they know to watch for that or were they, were they given advanced no, warning or they just... They, uh, they, according to what they tweeted, they were completely surprised because wow. Mike, Hopkins, wow. Mike Hopkins said uh, uh, something was launched into space today, not sure what it was, but it left this cloud. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, let's see... There was an ICBM launch out of, uh, out of near La Palma in uh, the Atlantic that a few uh, photographers caught a few about a month or so ago, too. Conspiracy theorists, <laughs> go! Oh, yeah, I think, I'm I think sure. they're getting rid of their inventory. There's been a lot of ICBM launch. Vandenberg's done a bunch of ICBM tests lately. Uh, and when the Syrian crisis was ratcheting up, the, I think it was the Israelis did a test, or it was uh, the U.S. Navy did a test of the Mediterranean at the same time. So, interesting. I'm sure we can find missiles. some. I'm we sure. all know that that was the uh, disintegration of a UFO, as it was. Uh, <laughs> uh, or a comet. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't checked the comment section yet, but I'm sure there'll be some interesting things there. Yeah, I'm sure it's like a comet that uh, had been unseen that is hiding Planet X. Anyway, uh, <laughs> let's let's move on to uh, to the actual comet that people are uh, going to be conspiracy theorizing about, uh, and that's Comet Ison. The update on Comet yeah, Ison. There, there was an interesting update. Some encouraging news came out of the uh, the 45th DPS meeting in Denver a few days ago that Ison may, in fact, survive perihelion. There was, uh, there was a study out of uh, astronomers out of the Lowell Observatory. They did uh, a few studies using a numerical analysis of previous comets and sun-grazing comets. Now, Ison isn't technically a crude sun grazer, but it has a lot of the same characteristics. It's going to be passing 1.1 million uh, kilometers from the surface of the sun. It's going to be uh, subjected to 5,000 degree Fahrenheit temperatures. I don't know what that is in Celsius, but it's really hot. And there's been a lot of discussion about everything I had heard up till this week said Ison maybe would be about 50-50 if it's going to survive perihelion. Uh, they seem to be pretty confident in their assurances uh, that Ison is bigger one thing that they tied this into, as I said, most comets that disintegrate when they pass that close, the cutoff size for the nucleus was about 200 meters. In Ison, their estimates are anywhere from half a kilometer up to two kilometers, so they think it's big enough that it's going to survive perihelion. They, they have a pretty good confidence. Now, this, is, this uh, goes against uh, all the hype we've been hearing out of, uh, so I think it's the university, it's one professor at the University of Physics down in uh, Columbia, Nancy, you've written about this before, where they were saying that ISIN is, is getting ready to disintegrate, and I've seen that same uh, a guy on the, the Yahoo message boards uh, saying that it's uh, he's issued a, an Amber Alert for Ison's going to disintegrate at any moment. Uh, and the rest yeah. of us are kind of like, where is this coming from? Do you have data that the rest of the world doesn't have somehow? Yeah, he, he for some reason does not like this comet. He just wants it to disintegrate. I think yeah. He, I, I he gather, hates these comets. I, I wonder if he thinks, well, if I keep saying it's going to disintegrate over six months and it disintegrates, then I'm probably going to be right. So, yeah. Right, yeah. Carl Badham's basically said the same thing. Uh, he's the astronomer at the uh, the Navy Observatory, and he's kind of heading up the uh, um, Comet Eisen observing campaign. And he said, you know, everything that we're seeing is that it's uh, that the comet is pretty much you know what we expected it to be. And uh, you know, if if it does disintegrate, and this uh, this guy turns out being right, it's just you know really? he's gonna he has he has as much. The chance of being right as, as we do. So it's, the, the, yeah. fam the, the famous comet Lovejoy, there were several Lovejoys, but the one everybody remembers that was bright back in 2011 was much fainter than Ison is right now at the same distance. So I think we're pretty hmm. well. I just saw Ison this morning for the first time for myself after one year after discovery and how many articles have I written is the first time I've seen it in person this morning. So it's, uh, nice. it's still very, very faint. Tenth magnitude for a comet. I wouldn't even have known sweeping the field at low power that there was a comet there unless I had known to look for it and, and put on high magnification and sweep around for it. Does it look green in, in person? It, it looks like you have to use averted vision, and it looks like maybe a, a little faint uh, globular cluster, but you gotta you got to know what's there. I, yeah, I, I, I would have totally missed it. If you look, Stuart Atkinson um, uh, at CumbrianSky.com or org, I can't remember uh, which it is, but anyway, 
just Google Stuart Atkinson, and uh, he took some pictures of it last night uh, over Kendall Castle in the UK, and he like did the uh, the gradual zooming in on pictures to show just how faint it is, and he you know he said I think I got it, but uh, yeah, it's st it's still pretty faint right now, but. Uh, Looking forward to having yeah. you frightened. It'll be Dad Zabo year. brought an image of it into our yeah. uh, virtual star party last week. No, not not lot, but he'd I, done it in the morning. I used Dad's uh, one of his images in the article I wrote this week too. So. Yeah, that was great. I saw that. Yeah. Uh, okay, great. So there's, I've, I've got a couple of like tiny things now. So uh, I've got here the space cat. <laughs> yeah, that the was Iranian we, space we, cat. We talked about that a few weeks ago, and I'm just thinking uh, that I've seen some rumblings that that launch may occur in the coming week. That uh, part of their program of having a, a manned launch by 2019 is they want to launch a cat, and they want it's probably going to be suborbital. I think like they did with the space monkey. Uh, earlier this year, uh, the, that kind of sparked Monkey Gate. Remember when they uh, the the same monkey, the same monkey in the photos, which they they showed a different monkey after as before. So there's, specu Gate. there's speculation that either the monkey didn't survive or they never actually launched the monkey because I kind of wonder if that's why they want to use a cat this time because they probably figure a cat is a little easier to switch than than uh, maybe they got burned on Monkey Gate. I don't know. But, uh, but you know, the only thing I have to say is it will be very ironic because when I wrote the post on Universe Today, I did some research and found out that, yes, a cat has been launched before by the French back in 1963. Fifty years ago this week, they did a suborbital launch of a cat, and that's the only other time. So if they launch on October 18th, uh, October 18th may become Space Cat Day. <laughs> Uh, and then I think the last thing, and Amy, I know you mentioned this, is the 45th anniversary of Apollo 7. Uh, yeah, there's my favorite picture of the launch um, that I just put on Twitter, too. Apollo 7 launched today in 1968. It was the first uh, manned Apollo flight, the first flight after the fire, um, of course. And it was the first flight of the Apollo Block 2 spacecraft, the one that ended up being the workhorse for the whole Apollo Skylab and Apollo Soyuz test programs. Um, so, yeah, kind of, kind of a big mission. One of the unsung heroes of the whole Apollo program, I'd say. Um, so go team. I'll be posting some pictures of those guys over the next few days <laughs> to commemorate the mission. Uh, so before before we let everyone go, then uh, Amy, uh, you've got some uh, you've got a new uh, a new gig going on. I do. I have a new home. Um, Vintage Space is now at Popular Science. Um, they just launched a blog network, and I am there. So you can go find me there, or still on my website because my whole archive is there. So. But they take and away the comments. And no, I noticed no. you guys have comments on the blog. We we get to set if we want comments or not. So I be good people because if you know if the trolls come out in full force, I won't do it. But I'm I'm happy to have discussion on my articles. So yeah, yeah I'm gonna leave comments on and, and try to get a try, still trying to get a hang of the the system they have. But that's yeah. very brave of you. Yeah, I, I might. It's been it's comments have been okay on my own site because you know it's not as big and public and people just rail me out on Google Plus instead of on my blog. But we'll see what happens on a bigger platform. So we all know how scary the internet yeah. can be. I know. But I know, like you, you <laughs> the, they did a bunch of them, right? You, Rebecca Watson's got a blog, yeah. and there's a bunch of people there. So yeah. it's a it's a big crowd. Um, yeah. Right for your life, Amy. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cool, uh, Dave Dickinson. Where do we find out more data? Yes, let's see, I was active this week on Universe Today, Astro Guys, Listasaur, uh, Canada.com, and I will be at the 2013 Necronomicon next weekend doing Star Party Duty on Friday night, and we have a Penumbra Lunar Eclipse that night, and Saturday night, and I'll be on a bunch of different planets, or uh, panels talking about <laughs> exoplanets. I wish planets. Uh, and, you know, if anybody wants to come up, argue about Nibiru or, like, Comet Ison or anything like that, I'll be there. Bring it show. on. Bring it on. That sounds great. All right. Jason Major. I uh, I am over at lightsinthedark.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter at JP Major. I am also writing at Universe Today and Discovery Space News. Um, you know, I've had a busy week today, so I haven't been doing too much writing, but um, you know, I did get uh, some interesting articles up uh, on Universe Today and uh, an interesting piece on the asteroid that may hit Earth in 2880, 1950 <gasps> DA. So go check that out at uh, Discovery News as well. 
And wow. it's also up on Fox News, uh, surprisingly enough. Uh, they picked up the article, but they spelled right. my name wrong, so I was all... Yeah. Thanks, uh, Fox yeah. News. Well, yeah. we have, I mean, we have these syndication agreements. Well, I wouldn't call it syndication agreement exactly. I have a, if you want to put my put our articles anywhere, go ahead. So uh, sometimes articles show up on io9 and I see them crop NBC up in and, yeah. yeah, and Yeah, and, you know, we're just cool with that. I think it's uh, it's it helps the writers get a little more publicity, so I think it's great. But spell uh, your yes. bylines right. It's, but spell the bylines right. The very <laughs> least you people can do is <laughs> write people's names way, so. properly. Yeah, yeah. How do they spell it, Jason? Majors. Majors. No, I've been no, I've been getting well, that's that. That's pretty good though. And I'm and I'm oversensitive to that because I've been getting that since I was a little little kid. You know, it was yeah. it was Jason Majors, Jason Majors, and my teachers. Is that the, like and, the five million dollar man? Yeah, yeah Lee, Lee Majors. Majors. Jason yeah, Majors. there we go. Uh, Nancy Atkinson, where do we find more? Universe Today, uh, every hey. day, and uh, Nancy underscore A at Twitter, and just a reminder to everybody, it's International Observe the Moon Night tomorrow night, um, the 12th, it. Saturday look night. So, so look at the moon. Uh, I think, I'm pretty sure their website is up. I don't think it's a NASA site, so uh, go check out their site and see if there's any um, Observe the Moon Night events close to you. And if you want something to help you with that, uh, we've got our free Phases of the Moon app that you can pick up for Android. So you just grab that from uh, from the Google Play Store. Phases of the Moon. It's really okay. cool. It is pretty cool. Uh, great. Well, thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks uh, for the team for joining us. And uh, we'll see you all next week. The next thing is the Virtual Star Party on Sunday night. So hopefully I'll be back from my travels then. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.